listen to our prayer. Okay, welcome back. Finally, we are reaching the end of this chapter 7, which is, as I always explain, this is one of the beautiful chapters in which Krishna reveals his self-identity. So, 26, 27, 28, in fact, we will be able to see 29 and 30. So, today, hopefully, we can cover the entire verses. Uh, this, the theme of this chapter is Krishna's nature. Krishna's nature means it is the nature of the absolute. Krishna is not talking here as Mr. Krishna, but Krishna is talking here as the Lord of the universe. So next week, we can do an end-to-end -end recap, uh, discussing the highlights. But where we stopped last week was Krishna after talking, revealing his self-identity, he said, it is not very easy for people to know me. So he said, uh, actually, I am not manifest to all. Even though I am there, I am not visible to a lot of people. So that is how we concluded the verse 25. Because, because of this yoga maya, because of this maya, because of that, People fail to see me properly. Even if they see me, they take me as a limited being. But they have no idea about the scope and depth of my nature. So that's, it is beyond your comprehension, but people always misunderstand me. And part of that is not their mistake because of this yoga maya. So he's going to expand on that topic a little bit further. Again, the concluding portion is, even though it is difficult to get hold of him, he is going to give one technique by which we can come to know him in its entirety. Because that is how he concludes the chapter. So he started explaining the chapter, unfolding his nature one by one. And he said, like, some people are matured. So they recognize Ishwara. They invoke Ishwara. Sometimes it may not be for the uh, ultimate knowledge. It may be due to Artha, Jinyasu, Artharthi, different, different means. But still people invoke me. And then what happens? Uh, depending upon their maturity, people try to seek different deities. And depending upon their rule of engagement, they have different, different rituals or practices. And whatever they seek, they get the result. And I am the one who is providing all these results. And then he said, it is very difficult for people to know me in its entirety. That's where we discussed, or that is where we stopped last week. So we will continue. So uh, Anu, if you don't mind, could you please chant verse 26? Anu, you there? I think she hasn't joined today. Okay, okay, so she said she is. So let me reshare with uh, voice. Share. I think Anu is joining. Anu, can you hear me? Hear us? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> So 
So 25, he said, people don't see me clearly because of yoga maya. But what about me seeing all of you? Krishna said, Vedaham Samati Tani. I know whatever happened in the past, it, it is known to me. And then he said, I know everything that is happening in the present. Then he said, I know what is going to happen in the future also. In other words, I am omniscient. I know everything. I know means everything happens in the universe according to the law, according to the vicinity of the law created by the Ishwara. Correct? So if I put, if I drop a um, phone, it goes down. Why? Because there is a law. According to a law, it functions. As human being, we may be aware of certain number of laws and we may not be aware of the laws. And once you know all the laws of the universe, you should be able to tell like what is going to happen, how it is going to happen, when it is going to happen. If X happens, what would be the next state? Everything you know. So Krishna or the Bhagavan or the Brahman or the reality it is omniscient. It knows everything. So all the possibilities of the future actions he knows. It's not that he is means he know what is going to happen to you tomorrow. No, that's not the case because uh, you have a prayatna also. It is not just karma that is going to determine your future. But what Krishna is saying here is that I know what happened in the entire past. I know. I know what is happening. I know. All the potentials of the future, I know. And everything is running in line with my order, in line with my laws. So that is what he meant. I am omniscient. I still remember Swami Dayananda always make a joke. This word omniscient had a, a particularity. If somebody tells that I am omniscient, ask the person to spell it. It has a peculiar spelling itself. So there it's, it's itself, it breaks. So Lord is saying that I am omniscient. Every laws are aligned with my laws of the nature, intelligent order of the nature. So that is what these two verses are saying. Vedaham samati tani. I am aware of the entire past. I am aware of the present. Bhavishyani Chabhutani. I know everything in the future. Everything happens according to my laws. Nothing can go beyond my laws. So that is what it means. And then he tells, Mantu Vedana Kaschanaha. But the problem is, even though I know everything that is in the universe, I know what is happening. I know the laws of the universe. I know the material of the universe. I know the, the process of the universe, everything known to me. But most of the people, right, they have no idea about me in, it, in its entirety. So I know everything, but most of the people, he tells all, none of the people, Shankaracharya clarifies in his commentary, except those who realize the Atman. So he just, Shankara was very particular in adding that exception of that rule. So he said, otherwise, what is the point in studying scriptures? So you can know him completely. Krishna clarifies that in the next verse. But the point is, I know all everything happens in the time is known to me. In fact, time is within my control. The time was born in, in me and the time exists in me. And the, finally, the time also goes back to me. So I have complete control over the time and I am omniscient. I know every law of the universe. In fact, every law of the universe is my manifestation. So that is what the point is. But the problem is the living being, they fail to understand me because of the very same reason. Because the change for you to pers means you are in a framework you are in time, in space time continuum, and you are trying to understand something beyond that, which is impossible. I gave you the other example. Just think about that. A person in a dream 
trying to understand the nature of the person lying on the bed. It is impossible because it is beyond the order of its existence. So it is very difficult for an individual living in this universe to conceive the Lord, to understand the Lord. But there is a means, Krishna is going to talk about that. So that is what the Brahman is beyond time. So in the previous verse, Krishna said, uh, I, even though I am there in each and every bit of the universe, it is difficult for, it means I'm not easily visible to people. Why? Because of the yoga maya. People don't see me. Even though they see the effect, they fail to understand the cause. And this verse, he clarifies that a little bit further. He tells, I, I know everything happens in the time, but people do not know me completely. So that's I know everything that exists in time. In fact, the time exists in me. That is what Krishna does. No one knows me and Obstructed by yoga maya, people do not understand the truth and therefore do not know the Lord. So now, why? Why people, what exactly is the obstruction in front of the people for knowing the Lord? Right now, means we have the knowledge, right? Krishna is saying that um, you are the Atma. What is the nature of the Atma? Almost every scripture talks about us, this knowledge part. Tattvamasi, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Atma Brahma. Everybody hear this, but still they fail to understand the Lord. So in the next verse, he is explaining why. But we have been discussing this for a long time. So you, you, it should not be a surprise for you. See, uh, I know, I know, I see you now. Could you please stand if you don't mind? 27. Icha Kresha Samuthena Vandva Mohina Bharata Sarva Bhutani Samuham Sarke Yanti Parantapa Again, brilliant summarization of what is happening. What exactly is the block? What exactly is that preventing individual in understanding Ishwara or the Lord? So he tells, due to, there are two things. One is likes and the other one is dislikes. Desires and aversion. So what happens is, I'm not able to see the world properly. That is the first reason. Because whatever I see the world is colored by my likes and dislikes. So if you remember, when we studied the Vedanta and also the second chapter of the Gita, we said, there is a truth called the Pradipasika Satyam. When I see a rope, sometimes I mistake that rope as a snake. And then what happens is, there are two orders of reality. In fact, three orders of reality. So in this particular example, I can see the rope as a rope. Second scenario is, I can see the rope as a snake. If I see the snake, sorry, rope as a snake, my reaction or my feeling and my response is as if I'm seeing a snake. So in Vedanta, we say, I see it, therefore it exists. The other scenario is, it exists, therefore I see it. Both effects are same. So what happens when I look at the world, I am looking at the world through a colored glass. And what exactly is that colored glass? It is likes and dislikes. I, have, I believe that I will be complete, I will be happy, I will be contented only with X, Y, Z. That is point number one. Second problem is what? The I I associate with is not the real I. So this is the problem. Means the first problem is identification. And the second problem is dependency. So these, these things happens because of this strong desires 
I mean, meaning the raga, likes and dislikes. And there is nothing wrong in having likes and dislikes because we need to understand that the psychology of the Gita. Gita is not going to tell you that tomorrow onwards, you should not have likes and dislikes. What Gita is saying is that you should not be controlled by the likes and dislikes. When I was talking about Karma Yoga in chapter two, I gave you one story of the Chinese um, rider, right? Well, somebody was riding a horse in ancient time, China, and some people asked him, where are you going? He said, I don't know, ask the horse because I have no control over the horse. So what happens is I do not have any control over the gadget given to me, which is my body and mind. And what happens, this mind has a strong likes and dislikes. And because of the strong likes and dislikes, what happens, this duality, the delusion of duality comes. Duality means many things in the universe. In fact, with that duality, I fail to see that unity of Ishwara. Because what we are saying is that it is Advaita. Advaita means what? It is everything in the universe is the manifestation of one reality. So I see the multiplicity, but I fail to see that unity. I see a snake as a snake. I see a tree as a tree, but I don't see the commonality between a snake, tree, and a rope. It is like I see a ring separately from a bangle, from a chain, because I fail to see the underlying reality, gold, which is common to all these things. So because of the strong likes and dislikes, because of this delusion, mental delusion, I see the world as world, and I fail to see the God in that world. Because why that is important? Krishna said that, when wherever there is a manifestation of a glory, that is my imminent nature. It's not the transcendent nature, but is it is the imminent nature. If you remember, he said, uh, like when the wetness of the water is me. So whenever you drink water, in fact, you can experience him and see him. But we don't see that, and we say that only as a water. And this is not your fault because. Your mind is pre-programmed like that. And as a result, what happens? All beings get into this delusion. Almost all the beings are deluded. He tells Arjuna, right from the beginning, every being in the creation is deluded. They don't see the truth beyond that apparent manifestation. They see only the imminence. They fail to see the transcendent. And this is because their wrong self-identity and attachment. So in Vedanta, if you go one step further, right? This delusion, what it, go, what, what it creates? It creates the instability of the mind. The mind won't be stable. And whereas these the, the powerful likes and dislikes, it creates mental impurity or the binding. So mala and vikshepa is the problem. So when the mind is not pure and the, when the mind is not stable, I fail to see the God. It is, I cannot do anything. So if a window, you are looking outside, you are looking means you, are, you went to a resort and the hotel has a, or the resort has a beautiful window and you are expecting a wonderful sight and look through the window. If that window is muddy, you cannot see anything. That doesn't mean that the sight is not there. And a good old example, a, a diamond is lying at the bottom of the, the lake. You, you are looking at the lake. If the lake is muddy and turbulent, you won't see that. So this, like the, the powerful influence of likes and dislikes, and the delusion born out of that wrong self-identity, it is going to put your mind into a complete delusory state. As a result, you fail to see. And all the being, almost all the beings are suffering this, means have this problem. Krishna is saying. So this is, this is why even though the God is as close as you, right? There is nothing, nothing closer than the Ishwara. So that we, but we fail to see that issue. That's why we take upavasa. What is upavasa? 
Anybody have done upaposas? Mean mean fasting. Fasting. Yeah, that is the literal meaning. But what is the literal? I mean, that is the the common meaning. But what is upavasa? What is the purpose of upavasa? Upa means literal meaning. Anybody? Ah, uh, food. Upa or... means close, right? Upa means close. Upavasa means stay. Stay close to the closest. What is the closest in you? I can say that India is far, but North Brunswick is close. I can say that North Brunswick is far, my laptop is close. I can say that laptop is far, my body is close. I can say that the body is far, but myself is the close. So the closest in me is the Atman in me. And Upavasa means it is a practice which helps me to stay closer to that closest or my own Atman. Beautiful word, right? Mm. So Upavasa is not staying, I mean, fasting and in the night, like <laughs> eat, compensating that eating. That is what the typical Upavasa is. Correct? In South, they uh, actually the regular food is the rice. So what do they do? They skip rice and they have 15 chapatis. That's one <laughs> typical Upavasa. They, I know the reason I'm telling is Ekadishi, I know. A lot of people at home, they just take chapati. And that day, they will eat more chapati. So anyway, that's not the point here. The point here is, these mental impurities has to be removed. Otherwise, Ishura will not be uh, revealed to you. Even though he is the most obvious, he is there right in front of you, but you will not see. So remember the word used by Krishna to call Arjuna here is Paramtapa. Param tapa means one who conquer all your enemies. Tapa means heat. Param tapa means you are a heat you of, for your enemies. Scorcher of enemies. But Krishna is saying that know that who is your real enemy. Not a person outside. So you have to conquer him. And how to con? This is your enemy. These um, the shut oiris, kama, krotha, moha, lopa, mada, matsarya, all these are your enemy. And uh, that way you will see Ishwara. And that's why, right, in Puranas, I'll talk to you about Puranas uh, later, uh, one session, because the symbolism has to be um, brought out properly. And also the history has to be discussed because otherwise if anybody reads Purana, it is going to be really, really, really confusing. Because you may think that what, what, what exactly they have written there. So these Puranas, so for example, every story, these Asuras are described as one with a big tongue, uh, with a large dhamstra, and their sense organs are always uh, exaggerated. And these people, symbolically represents the means we saw asura who is asura in the gita a couple of words back the one who engages in the external world and fail to understand the higher nature that is asura so in the puranas you could see that the lord kills these asuras whether it is vishnu or shiva or devi you can see that ishwara kills this asura and typically what happens when this asura kills what happens somebody pops up from that and they always prostrate and pray to the Lord. What happens? It's a new birth. So it's, it's like you can say that when Narendra went to Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, what happened? Ramakrishna Paramahamsa killed the old self of Narendra. From that, the Vivekananda came out. Balakrishna Menon went and saw Swami Sivananda and he was killed. Ramakrishna, Balakrishna Menon was killed and Swami Chinmayananda came out. So that's what it means. And you can see, one more point is, what exactly is the weapon Vishnu uses to kill these Asuras? Sudarshanam. Sudarshanam means it's the correct vision. So by providing the correct vision, 
these impurities of the mind and the turbulence of the mind can be controlled and that is going to uh, help you to see the lord so coming back to the sequence 25 26 said that even though i am the most obvious i am not visible easily visible and on verse 27 krishna said uh, even means why i am not visible because the mind is deluded with the strong wrong identity and extreme obsession or because of the likes and dislikes as a result you fail to see god so all beings in the creation from the beginning of the creation go to a state of total delusion and this delusion is born out of duality because you see one as many and uh, the opposite the opposites themselves are not a problem meaning uh, the likes and dislikes opposites meaning likes and dislikes opposite themselves are not a problem the problem is the obsession and aversion extreme obsession to something and an extreme aversion to the other so it is okay to have karma but the problem is it's an extreme obsession to karma that is where i get deluded so this is the reason why i don't see ishwara so the next verse is a kind of a recap of what we saw from chapter 2 to chapter 5. Let's see. Anu, could you chant? Yesham Tvantagatam Papam Jananam Punyat Karmanam Te Tvandva Moha Nirmuktaha Bhajante Maam Dhrudha Vrataha Okay. Bhajante Maam Dhrudha Vrataha So, if you attain certain state, that person, he is committed to me, he tries to know me. When? The first three lines tells. Yesham. So here he tells in whom, Yesham is a universal pronoun. He whom all the sin has ceased to exist. But what is sin? It is not the original sin. Right? The, here sin means it is the mental impurities. So he in whom all the mental impurities are flushed out. And how these mental impurities are flushed out? Jananam punya karmana. So by the good deeds, by the practice of karma yoga. So by the practice of karma yoga in whom all the mental impurities are flushed out. Then he tells, like, what happens? When the mental impurities are flushed out, they, what happens? They're, they will be freed from the delusion of duality. So they will be able to see things as they are. So in psychology, we call it as, they call it as objectivity. You will be able to see objectively. You will see a cat as a cat. You will see a person as a person. You don't color it with your likes and dislikes. So when a person with a commitment of Karma Yoga practices the Karma Yoga, what happens? His sins or the mental impurity. Because if you remember, we have been talking about this from chapter 2 to chapter 5. The practice of Karma Yoga is for the removal of mental impurity. And the practice of Upasana Yoga is for the stability. It is implied here. So when you practice this yoga, what happens? The mental impurity will be flushed out. The mind will be stable. And that person is committed to Ishwara and he is eligible for seeking the higher knowledge. Without that, if I go and try to learn the scriptures, uh, without practicing, meaning without this karma yoga and upasana yoga practice, what is going to happen is the knowledge will be there, but it will stay as paroksha anupuri. It will be only a theory. Right now, it's only a theory for us. But when that theory becomes experiential, it is only after the flushing out of all these mental impurities. So coming back to our original spiritual path, or the sequencing of the spiritual activity. We need to be very 
very clear in what we are seeking and why we are doing certain things. We are practicing Karma Yoga and Upasana Yoga for gaining a Chitta, chitta that is a mind that is pure and that is stable. So for Chitta Shuddhi and Chitta Stidhi, we practice the yoga. And once we have the Chitta Shuddhi and the Chitta Stidhi, whatever knowledge you are listening, it will go in. So most of the spiritual practitioners, they don't worry about Karma Yoga or Upasana Yoga, but they just go ahead and try to learn the Upanishads, Tattvamasi. Yes, it will be an intellectual exercise. It will help you to um, think, yeah, I mean, understand logically, but it won't be an experience. And when it is not an experience, Krishna is saying that what such people fail to see me properly. Such people fail to see me properly. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, you will see in verse 10, means chapter 10, Krishna, Arjuna wanted to see the Ishura in its entirety. Krishna said, you cannot see right now. I have to give you some special privilege to see you because you cannot see me right now because you, you haven't fleshed out your mental impurities. So that's what it is. So this practice of Karma Yoga and the practice of Upasana Yoga is extremely, extremely the high priority spiritual practice for all the spiritual seekers. Even in the second chapter, Krishna is highlighting that. So that is what is for those people who uh, fleshed out their mental impurities through the practice of good deeds or the karma yoga. And what happens? Such people will be freed from all the delusion. And when they feel free from the delusion, they will be committed to that higher cause. They will not see the Ishwara with the practice of karma yoga and dupasana yoga. Only knowledge can make that access. Remember, we studied in the Atma Bodha. The first, the uh, second verse of Atma Bodha, Krishna tells, like, there is both dothonya sathano pihi. Now, there is no other means for the liberation or knowing the self other than knowledge. And we explain that in detail. Here. It means even in the second chapter. If the problem is ignorance, any amount of meditation is going to remove that ignorance. But the meditation is going to give me that mindset or that proper mental state, which is required to seek that knowledge. So that's what it is. So again, highlighting the importance of Karma Yoga and Upasana Yoga, meaning yoga in particular, Krishna is telling that, practice that yoga. That's very, very important. So, how to free from oneself from this Papa Karma and mental impurities. Papa Karma means mental impurities. Karma Yoga is the means. Karma Yoga will free us from the spell of likes and dislikes. It will help you to transcend the likes and dislikes. We are going to see in the chapter 3, later point of time, because Krishna is not telling us to remove all the likes and dislikes. It's impossible. In fact, even Krishna had likes and dislikes. Correct. He he had a particular hairstyle. He used to play a particular song. Flute was his instrument. And he used to wear yellow clothes. So he had likes and dislikes. The problem is not with the likes and dislikes. So means one of the definitions of yoga is yoga ha karma su kaushala, the efficiency in action. Efficiency means selecting appropriate actions. So what happens is whenever I have a set of possibilities from which I can pick up an action, typically what drives for the drive for any individual to pick what is the action he is going to do is his likes and dislikes. So the karma yoga shift the selection, selection criteria of an action from like driven by likes and dislikes. It select, it changes that to the dharma, what is to be done. So the shift there is, I will shift from what I feel to do to what I need to do. There is a huge difference. What I feel to do versus what I need to do. So the likes and dislikes will be there, but my actions will be driven by the basis of dharma, not the likes and dislikes. And that is how I 
flush out all these negative sins from the mind. So this freedom from delusion and the karma yoga will enable you in seeking Ishwara. And such people, like once you have that pure memory, such people will seek Ishwara with a commitment. So 26, 27, 20, 26, 27, and 28. 26, Krishna tells that I'm not easily visible to people. 27, Krishna tells that why I am not visible to people? Because um, one is your mind is not pure and your wrong self-identity deluded you and as a result, you are not seen. And on verse 28, Krishna tells the means for you to get out of, means out of this problem is practice Karma Yoga. And when you practice Karma Yoga, your mind is pure and with a pure mind, you can see me and I will reveal you. That is the next verse. <clears throat> so the last two verses is the concluding verses or the Charama Shloka. Typically, the style of the Bhagavad Gita is the final verse of a chapter will give an indication to the next chapter. So you can see uh, the last two verses are going to indicate about what is coming in the eighth chapter. So let's listen to the verse 29. So Anu. Jara Marana Mokshaya Mama Shritya Yatanti Te Brahmatvidukritsnam Adhyatmam Karma Chakilam. Beautiful verse. So it is a continuation of the previous verse. He tells, so in the previous verse, he said, You practiced yoga, and when you practice yoga, what happens? You fleshed out all your impurities and your mind is pure and such people will have commitment to Ishwara and when the second line Mama Shritya Yatanti so those who strive and those who strive in knowing me what happens eventually they will come to me and what happens Te Brahma Tat Viduhu so he tells those people after gaining a purified mind who are committed to me, he tells Te Brahma Tat Viduhu, Krishna. So Krishna means entirety. So those people, once they have that pure mind, when they committed to me, they will come to me or know me in my entirety. It's not a little bit means you will know me in its fullest sense. So this is the promise given by Ishwara. And what is the biggest benefit of that state? He tells Jara Marana Mokshaya. Jara means old age. Marana means death. So the means it indicates all the sufferings in the universe. Mokshaya means freedom. So freedom from old age and death. Please don't take the literal meaning. That doesn't mean that if you get self-realized, you won't have old age and you don't have death. Somebody was asking me the other day. But the counter answer is what? Right now, per my definition, who am I? It's my body, right? Per my current, in the current state, my definition of me is my body. So when you get to know Ishwara, when you get to know Atma, what happens? The self-identity has changed from the body to the Atma. So the Jara is going to happen to the body. The death is going to happen to the body. But I, I am not affected by that because I know that it is a gadget belonging to me. So that is what is Moksha. Moksha is freedom from suffering. So the other day I was referring a book called Search Inside Yourself, uh, even in the last class. So again, I'm going to make a reference to that book. You can see the mindfulness portion of that book. There is a beautiful explanation on the difference between pain and suffering. 
mind you this is means that explanation is not from a vedantic perspective it is based on the neurology what is pain versus what is suffering pain is a sensation whereas suffering is a mental reaction so even in that book what they are telling like this is a, an official curriculum in google what they are concluding is that you have means pain with respect to pain you have no choice pain is inevitable you cannot avoid even a self realized master will have to go through pain but the suffering is optional the pain is inevitable but the suffering is optional so that is the shift in identity so krishna is saying that so those who cleared their mind from all the sins with the practice of yoga and when they commit to me and when they try to know me Uh, they will come to know me in its entirety and what is going to happen they will be freed from all the sufferings why because atyatmam karma chakilam they will come to know everything cha akilam means entire am completely atyatmam they will know their own self they will have their own self identity will be revealed to them and they will know everything about karma all the actions all the actions means the secret of actions everything will be revealed to them so once again there is a proper sequence uh, chapter verse 26 he tells i am not easily visible 27 tells i am not visible because of your mental impurity and the delusion born out of that and verse 28 he tells you can get out of that mental impurity by the practice of karma yoga and verse 29 is saying that once you practice the karma yoga once you gain that purity if you try to know me i will reveal myself in its entirety and when i reveal myself in its entirety you will be freed from all the sufferings and you will come to know the real nature of yourself as well as the actions it cannot be any clearer than this krishna is making it very clear he is talking about the the freedom from the duality right and he is talking about the sequencing of activities and he is clearly saying that the action will not take you to the final destination but it is only the knowledge and uh, but he is clearly saying that action means karma yoga is definitely a prerequisite for gaining the knowledge and this is where people make a lot of mistakes a lot of books has uh, this concept uh, not properly represented so Uh, please have this clarity uh, i struggled to myself with almost 10 years with this idea because initially my thought was karma yoga uh, raja yoga jnana yoga hatha yoga all these yogas will is just uh, parallel path but they are not parallel path of course parallel path for gaining the mental purity but once you gain the mental purity only more, only uh, knowledge can gain this uh, liberation uh, arnab ji just out of academic purpose uh, just want a clarification for you um, this particular portion this particular sequence is not what dualist talk this is a pure advaita vedanta idea whatever i just what i just said so from a dualist perspective it is the grace of the god that is going to give them the liberation So there is a difference but uh, mm. this is one of the key difference uh, between dvaita and uh, advaita so um, rajesh ji just to repeat that mm. dualists do not believe in liberation through like uh, you know self effort or uh, dualist don't see knowledge as a mandatory requirement for liberation perfect yeah whereas advaita tells that uh, only knowledge can liberate you shankaracharya makes it very clear knowledge means it is not the knowledge shankaracharya is telling only the knowledge about ishvara it can gain from different sources so i can extend that argument saying that okay uh, let's say that a new uh, master pops up tomorrow if he gives the self knowledge that knowledge is good enough to liberate so that is not a fanatic statement that's what i wanted to prove 
can a can a atheist be knowledgeable atheist means who what is the definition of the atheist let's talk about that atheist Someone means a person who do not believe in any scriptures any existing scriptures mm. right but mm. if he happens to know this knowledge he can become self realized absolutely but uh, for that unknowingly he has to practice karma yoga because without karma yoga what happens the mind is not pure and then he has to expose to this teaching uh, not as a scripture but as a scientific book or as an article or as a conversation he can gain it so uh, the role of the scripture here is to serve as this road map and uh, that's it so scripture has that much value in it but i think um, from per, from a personal perspective uh, what i found is this is the most logical explanation you do the karma yoga mm -hmm. there is a clear goal why yeah. you are doing it because you wanted to get uh, freedom from all or flesh out all the impurities of the mind you do upasana yoga look at the upasana yoga beautifully defined um, actually this is four types of upasana upasana of the body upasana of the speech upasana of the sense organs upasana of the mind it is going to give you that perfect discipline and when the mind is stable um, actually if you look at all the scientific neurological psychological discoveries um, you will see uh, pretty much all these upasanas comes there um, and finally uh, the no it means see if the problem is ignorance because all the, the different schools of vedanta unequivocally agree that the problem of uh, the suffering is ignorance but what the dualist is saying that the grace of the god is good enough to remove that uh, ignorance but here krishna means what bhagavad gita is saying because if i interpret these sanskrit verses line by line uh, it is pretty much what shankara tells that is what i feel again it is up to people to take whatever they want and uh, we are not here to con means condemn any dualist or um as qualified monoist but i was just trying to explain very clearly that uh, this point of view i just expressed is a pure advaita vedanta ideology and lot of masters you listen to like swami chinmayananda or swami dayananda uh, and even the contemporary masters like jayaro uh, and uh, or swami saropriyananda everybody falls to follow that school but if you go to any scorn lecture uh, it will be different Totally. One or two. Both has its own perspective, but that's it. Let's keep it there. Right, Raj Rajaji. Isn't God's right. grace a prerequisite for gaining that knowledge? The what is that? God's grace. Is it a prerequisite? Absolutely. Yeah, but I means the grace is without grace you cannot uh, get it. But the grace is like when you do the dharma, the grace will come automatically. so how to earn the grace that is where the advaita differs from lot of other schools advaita feels that by doing what needs to be done when you confirm to the law of ishwara you are you are committing to dharma and when you are following the dharma naturally you will earn the grace mm. but some um, religious schools like um, they say that in spite of doing that you have to go and uh, do that uh, nine kinds of bhakti right you have to do the prostration you have to do the puja or those worship yes so, so it's okay like that is definitely a means but that is not the exclusive means there so we need to see things in different perspective uh, what i was trying to convey again this is academic we don't have to go to that level but uh, see, i mean i know that you you had a lot of questions regarding this difference between advaita advaita yes, so yes. um one of the thing at least i feel is if you are a committed dwaitin if it means naturally you are conformed to dharma you cannot hurt anybody you will have to commit and you will be practicing devotion and when you practice that devotion what happens you will be will have a pure mind and what happens is when you have that pure mind you cannot miss that knowledge knowledge will come to you a teacher will come to you you will be exposed to that so Rajaji, isn't upasana yoga the same as the practice of devotion? Upasana yoga can be 
practice of devotion also but upasana yoga can be a, a pure meditation technique like a body scan is an upasana yoga right the body. relaxation meditation is upasana yoga the concentration meditation is upasana yoga expansion meditation is upasana yoga and uh, finally the value meditation is also upasana yoga so bhakti upasana is there but upasana is not just limited to that again the word upasana is what the yoga that helps you to keep closer to yourself that is what is upasana yoga so the bhakti yoga is an easy way okay so now we are coming to the last verse of the seventh chapter typically the style of the bhagavad gita is just to give a hint to the next chapter so let's na hum jara i know could you chant sadhi bhuta dhiray bhammam sadhi yajnam chaye viduhu prayana kale pichamam te vidur yukta chetasah okay that's very beautiful so they see krishna tells with this knowledge because we said you practice the yoga first you get a pure mind a stable mind with that you seek knowledge you will come to know me and how do you come to know me this is beautiful sa adibhutaadi so the source source of adibhuta bhuta means all the elements of the universe adibhuta means the primordial source of all the material cause of the universe adibhuta bhuta means elements adibhuta means the primordial element the basic building block of the universe point number 1 each word has a lot of significance so sadibhutani then what adi deva sa means sati pudani adi deva adi deva means you see all the de- deities so you see a source to gain your finance you see another deity for help you see another deity for enjoyment everything but they are all down the chain so you have to understand that i am the fundamental deity of the whole universe adi deva so he tells adi deva and adi bhuta so i am the primordial cause of the universe i am the all the the deities all the laws of nature deities are nothing but the laws of the nature universe so the whole the, the primordial and the primordial element is me and then he tells adi yajna yajna means the spiritual practices and i am the most fundamental or the source of all the spiritual practices so i am the source of the whole universe material universe i am the source of all the laws and i am the source of all the spiritual practices so a person who seek knowledge with a pure mind come to know me in its my entirety and he knows me as the adi bhuta means the primordial element adi deva the five primordial law of the universe and adi yajna so chaye viduhu they those who know me so then he tells what when should i prayana kale pichamam even at the end of the life he comes to know me like uh, with the steadfast mind that is good enough even at the last just prior to the death if i come to know that is good enough then there is no rebirth for that person because his identity will be becoming one with the brahman so i just wanted to bring your attention to that one line prayana kale pichama at the end of your life so naturally the next chapter's theme is what happens immediately after the death so that's a topic everybody is very much interested so that is going to be the theme of the next chapter the next chapter is going to talk about the different kinds of mukti uh, how the soul moves from one place to the other so that is the theme of chapter 8 so once again let me re- re- summarize the whole five verses we covered so verse 26 krishna talks about 
the point that I am not easily visible to people. Even though I am pretty much available, people fail to see me. That is point number one. Point number two is why people fail to see me because the mind has impurity. And when the mind has impurity, it creates delusion and gives two problems. One is wrong identity and wrong, means obsession. Because of that, I won't, you won't see me. That is 27. 28, how to get out of that problem? Practice yoga. When you practice yoga, what happens? You're all the, the sins. Sin means the mental impurity. And finally, uh, when you do that, when you have a pure mind, you will be committed to the knowledge. And 20 means then Krishna tells, when you are committed to that knowledge, you will know me in my entirety. That is what it is. And then he tells on 30th verses, uh, the verse 30 he tells, when you know me in its entirety, you will know me as the source, the primordial source of all the elements. You will know me as the primordial source of all the laws of nature and primordial source of all the uh, laws of the nature and no sorry all the spiritual practices so adi puta adi deva and adi yajna these are the three things he used and even if you come to know this only at the last moment of the life that is good enough so what exactly is that last moment that part we will see that in chapter uh, eight so right now means we completed 30 verses of the seventh chapter the whole theme of this chapter was Krishna was just discussing he so means who are who is he? What is the nature of that Ishwara? So next week, what we will do is we will do an end-to-end -end recap of this chapter because this is such a such an important chapter. So please feel free to post all the questions you have on this chapter in the group. We will try to answer that also. And then we can decide, right, should we start, when shall we start chapter 8? Uh, so, Anu, if you don't mind, could you please chant from 26 to 30? Vedaham samatitani vattamanani charjuna bhavishyani cha bhutani maam tu veda chakat Mam tu veda na kashchena, icha dvesha samuthena, vanva mohena karata, sarva bhutani samoham, sarke yamti parantapa, yesham pantagatam papam, jananam punya karmanam, te dvanva mohanir muktaha. Bhajante maam drutavrataha jara marana mokshaya mama shritya yatanti te pramhatatvidukritsnam adhyatmam karma chakhilam sadhi bhutadhi daivam maam sadhi yajnan chaye viduhu prayana kale pichamam Devi Duryukta Chetasaha Om Tat Saditi Shri Mat Bhagavad Gita Su Upanishad Su Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri Shri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Jnana Vijnana Yoga Nama Saptamodhyayaha Thank you. That's great. Really thankful to God for completing this chapter. I think we started this with uh, the time of Corona. Um, so we were able to finish that in that period. So it's a blessing. This chapter is such an important chapter. So thank you very much for being there. And uh, we will recap next week. And thank you very much, Rajaji, for taking us through this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> nice. Very much. Thanks, Rajesh. Thanks. Thank you.